So our challenge, I guess, on this panel will be to, to meet the, the high standards set by our opening talk and, and clearly our, our first panel. Um, it's pretty stunning the amount of signature authority on capital investment that, that was just on the stage. Um, as I said, the bios for our panelists are, are in your packet, um, so pr please read those. I won't re read those for you and so your intelligence. Uh, I'll, I will make some introductory comments on the panelists. Uh, one thing I'd like to do before we do start this discussion, though, on the competition for customers, um, I would like to acknowledge the group that helped put this together. Um, so, Jay Jimerson, where are you? Back over uh, by the refreshments. And Tom Flaherty, it's Tom back in the back. And Bruce Stover, um, Bruce is right here. Uh, so. That's been our organizing group, but also a, a really key figure in this is Dr. Depanker Ghosh. So where's Depanker? Back over by the coffee. Um, so Depanker is also the director of the Price Energy Institute, so lots of credit to him. And then uh, the team here, um, Taylor and Adam and Keith, um, doing all the technical details. So if you guys give all of them a round of applause, we'd appreciate it. So we're gonna, we're gonna dive in. Um, so we have uh, three panelists up here that really represent uh, some unique and important parts of the customer part of this equation. Um, so we uh, got Brian and Wes and Melanie. Um, Brian's with Calpine. Uh, if you're not familiar with Calpine, they're actually a pretty big organization. Uh, if you ever drive over south East of Tulsa, uh, there's a big combined cycle gas plant at Coweta that, that you used to own, a uh, big part of the power mix here. Um, OU grad, um, Wes with Chenier. Um, Chenier, for most of you in the familiar in the LNG markets, doesn't need a lot of introduction, uh, but there's a lot of dynamics in that space right now. Again, uh, an OU grad. Uh, trading background, so uh, lots of, uh, of interest there on the gas side. Uh, Calpine also has some renewables in the portfolio, though. And then Melanie on the end, um, she'll uh, give you some insights. Um, Melanie and I go way back. Uh, she, in the latter part of the Clinton administration, she's She's probably a Democrat that you don't realize how much she's done for the development of the North American gas markets, uh, starting uh, with Secretary Ernie Moniz, who at that time was Undersecretary of Energy in the Clinton administration, um, but just an amazing amount of work that they did that led up to, and she kind of gigged me, I I think uh, it might have been Dean Stice was saying that, uh, you know, not a lot of people saw this shale thing coming in 10 years ago, and she took issue with that, that she saw it coming uh, more like 20 years ago. <laughs> so, we, we set up a company together in yeah, 2002. Yeah. Uh, but Melanie's now with the Energy's Future Initiative, and she partners with Ernie, and she's going to tell you something about that. So uh, with that, let's uh, go ahead and kick it off. Uh, start with you, Brian, and you can tell us what you're doing and kind of your thoughts in the customer space. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, first of all, again, thanks to University of Oklahoma for, for having us. I was born and raised about an hour down the road, so it's great to be home, uh, and it's really just an honor to be here. A uh, little bit about Calpine. We are one of the largest independent power producers uh, in the U.S. We uh, have in, in the ground capacity of roughly 28,000 megawatts. Uh, it's predominantly natural gas fired generation. Uh, geographically diverse, we're all domestic. Uh, our three major markets are California, Texas, and the Northeast. Uh, to give you some idea of scale for 28,000 megawatts, one megawatt is roughly enough electricity to power 1,000 homes, so that, that'll give you some idea. Uh, on a peak day, our gas burn can be over 2 BCF, so for you uh, natural gas folks in the room, that, that should give you some perspective on what our, uh, our fuel uh, burn capabilities are. Uh, thinking about Calpine, uh, kind of three core values that we have. One is uh, we push for competitive markets. 
Uh, second is environmental stewardship, and third would be uh, you know customer relations or community relations. Uh, and you know, first and foremost, it's it's competitive markets. We believe that competitive markets ultimately lead to uh, lower electric prices, which are good for consumers, industry, promote, promote economic development. Uh, environmental steward, or, excuse me. We also believe that uh, competitive markets uh, ultimately lead to positive environmental impact. Uh, efficient markets push out um, inefficient old units and replace it with new, efficient, cleaner units. And then last, which is something we're going to hit on really hard today, uh, is you know, competitive markets ultimately lead to the best solutions. You know, one of the things that we've hit on is uh, what's the appropriate mix for generation in each of the individual markets. And so that's the conversation that, you know, is really difficult. And we talked about, you know, the, the need to get everyone in the room on the first panel and, and whether or not we could sing Kumbaya. And I tend to agree with Mike on a, on a federal basis. I don't believe that's possible. On a state-by-state -state basis and on a market-by-market -market basis, I think we're actually starting to see that happen. Uh, as it pertains to customers, I'm on the wholesale side of the business, so for me it's all about relationships. Work really hard uh, to get close to, to our customers and understand that their needs and their fears, and then work you know, tirelessly to try and come up with products and services uh, to solve those problems. Uh, you know, markets are constantly changing. The customer needs change with it. And you know, due to that, you know, we have to stay lockstep with each other. But you know, for me, customers are all about relationships. And, uh, and being able to find mutually beneficial outcomes. Uh, Maynard said it really well. Uh, he made the point about finding uh, ways to economically motivate people. And, and solving problems and economically motivating people is the name of our business. Thanks, Brian. Um, Wes, tell us about Chenier. Uh, just to echo other comments, very happy to be here. Um, very uh, gracious to the University of Oklahoma to include Chenier in this excellent event. Um, probably have heard about us. We're obviously uh, first to export off U.S. shores, um, continental U.S. shores. And uh, just to give you some brief background on what we're doing at Chenier, um, since we started our first cargo off the uh, facility at Sabine Pass in February 2016, we've done over 600 cargoes to 32 countries, um, adding seven countries last year uniquely. Uh, so we're proud of that. Um, and as it relates to customers, the amount of, cust the amount of customers that we envision in our business um, is substantial. And we can't get that done without what we consider to be customers on both ends of the ship. So from upstream at the wellhead, all the way to regas um, in Asia, uh, Latin America, Europe. Um, so we can't get any of that done without a uh, complete uh, supply chain stream of, of customers. Um, just a couple more stats. Uh, we've been uh, since, I'll, I'll give you the 2017 and 2018. So the total um, export that we've done in volumetrically, uh, 2017, 2018, uh, is a little more than 1.7 trillion cubic feet. Um, and to put that into perspective, uh, that is what the U.S. draws out of storage on a almost normal winter. Um, so that's quite a bit of gas. Uh, and not to upstate Ryan by any stretch of imagination, uh, we're now handling five BCF a day on the desk um, at our five trains at Sabine Pass and our one train at Corpus Christi. Uh, we have further development occurring at Corpus and further development occurring at SPL. Um, and we envision that we'll be around six BCF a day in wintertime standards, wintertime conditions, uh, come this winter. Um, and just to give you a little bit more perspective on, on what that's about, our trade desk, we've got five traders, including myself. We've got a team of um, eight schedulers, and uh, it's a lean, mean machine when you think about uh, um, volume per person on that sort of, uh, that sort of effort. Um, so we're excited about it. We're proud of what we're doing. We recognize that we are uh, basically the proof of concept at this point, and um, we have taken that responsibility very seriously. Um, and we are working every day to make sure that we're doing it right, again, from wellhead to regas. Um, so excited to be here and excited to talk more about the, uh, the customer chain that we, uh, that we engage. Thanks, Wes. Melanie, you, you've studied all of these areas early on. Um, tell us what you guys are doing at EFI now and uh, your thoughts on customer markets and especially this balance of what we're looking at. 
the the um, I was just sitting here thinking about Calpine and and Chenier and my history at the Department of Energy. Calpine reminds me of the California electricity crisis and and uh, where where uh, the structure of markets became a, a, a huge issue. Um, uh, we were in the early stages of restructuring electricity markets and, and uh, California did some interesting things and, uh, and, uh, but we dealt with Calpine a lot then. Chenier, when I went back to the uh, Department of Energy in the, in the Obama administration, the first thing we did was LNG export permits and and to expedite that process and so so uh, I always look at these things from a policy perspective. At the Energy Futures Initiative, we are very focused on on deep decarbonization and but how do you do deep decarbonization and meet fundamentally 2030 and 2050 goals? Um, uh, uh, taking into consideration key regional differences, um, uh, the, uh, uh, looking at the range of options that regions have in this country, and, and seeking flexibility in policy. And uh, I agree with you, nothing is going to happen at the federal level right now. Um, although we were taking bets, I was in Chicago last night giving a talk taking up bets whether within five years there would be a carbon tax. I said yes. Um, uh, er actually, everyone said yes. And um, so, so, uh, so you might see some action uh, in the future, not right now, um, but looking at state-by-state -state policies and a specific focus on renewable portfolio standards. And my view is they've worked. They, uh, there are 29 states have them. 50% uh, of the, uh, the uh, re uh, generation, renewable generation from 20, 2000 to 2014 is attributed to renewable portfolio standards, but I think we need to broaden the, uh, the umbrella and make it clean energy standards. That's only electricity. We got to focus on all of the, uh, all of the uh, carbon sources, and, um, and uh, so we are very focused on that. Yeah. So Melanie, you, you had some slides. Do you want to show those now, or do you want to? Let me, yeah, let me, let me, that's, that's what I was going to do it, uh, in the beginning. Let me, let me, um, I'm just going to do a few framing slides here. The, uh, I was just thinking, uh, uh, listening to people talk, and, and about the topic here, when, uh, when I left the Clinton administration, Bill Richardson is a friend of mine, and, and he was a secretary, had been, and I called him up afterwards, and I had been offered a job as a vice president at the Gas Technology Institute. And I asked him, should I take the job? And he said, gas, great, green. And, and that was, in the Clinton administration, gas was viewed as a very green fuel at that time. Um, a lot of things have changed since then, but that was, that was the uh, focus. Um, I'm just, uh, and so I want to, uh, and my view has always been that gas and renewables should be working together. And I'm going to show you a few things as to why. And what you're seeing coming up here, this is uh, wind and solar generation in the state of California for every day for one year, 2017. And the red is solar, the blue is wind, and the black line is a modeler's definition of peak, okay? It's complicated, but it's really peak. And what you see here coming up at the end here, the number 90, is there were 90 days in California in 2017 with little to no wind. Okay, so, and you had periods of 10 days at a time, seven days and nine days at a time where there was no wind. So the, the message I would take out of this, you also had days where wind and solar did not meet peak. So, so I look at this, and I look at 10 days at a time with, with, no, uh, with no wind. And then I look at the storage technologies and the duration. 
This is PJM. This is, these are, I think this is uh, from Cal ISO um, uh, data and uh, actually EIA data. PJM, the duration of their storage is an hour. They are using storage for ancillary services in PJM. Uh, Cal ISO, they've got a little bit of storage, I don't know what it is, um, that gives a, has a duration of uh, 10, 14 hours, but most of it is four hours. When you are talking about uh, periods of 10 days with no wind, which you saw in the previous uh, slide, you need fuel. We don't have battery technologies at this point in time, and I don't think by certainly by 2030, battery technologies that are going to give you 10 days of storage to accommodate the fact that you had 10 days with no wind. And so this is where I think you need a fuel. This is where I think gas and, and renewables need to be working together. Gas is the peaking fuel. It can load, follow, and um, that's important. What you're seeing coming up here, this is a World Bank study. These are select metals, minerals, and processes for wind storage wind, solar, and battery storage technologies. And, and I have gone through, the, uh, the green is number one in the world in that resource, the, the resource or process for wind, uh, solar, battery technologies. And the blue is you're in the top five. Okay, concentration of those top fives varies dramatically, but you're in the top five, and I'll show you some of what they are in a minute. United States, no number ones, 11, 11 uh, in the top five. Cuba, interestingly enough, is in two in the top five. One of them is cobalt. We need to be paying attention to Cuba, okay? Um, right now we are uh, 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 isolating them diplomatically, but they've got cobalt in the Western Hemisphere. South America, Peru, uh, Peru and Chile are number one, Chile's number one in uh, lithium. You go over here to Africa, uh, uh, Congo number one in cobalt, and uh, South Africa is number one in a couple, and uh, Guinea is, that's bauxite. Europe, basically nothing, okay? It's, it, it, you know, very populated, wants wind and solar, but doesn't have access to a lot of resources. Asia is amazing. Uh, look at what's coming up here. Um, no number ones yet, but you get to China. 10 number ones, six in the top five, so major players in 16. Australia, five number ones, 10 in the top five. Show you a little bit about what they are here. North America, again, no number ones. You can see them coming up here. South America, uh, copper, lithium, that's Chile, silver, Peru. This is what Asia looks like. Here's the top five, aluminum smelter capacity. These are all China, ref except for one, refinery production, cadmium, chromium, indium, pig iron, raw steel, molybdenum, silicon, rare earths, and titanium. Kazakhstan is number one in chromium, okay? All the rest, number one is China. And here is what Australia is number one in. The, the, uh, the point I would make here is is this is not going to stop us from, from uh, uh, deploying renewables, but we need to be thinking about protecting these supply chains. And I'm not sure that, that cartel pricing is reflected in prices yet. Uh, there were 15 countries in OPEC when OPEC was founded. Okay, we saw what their cartel pricing did, and there's a risk of that. I mentioned the regional, uh, regional differences. These are generation technology, size, and, and amounts. Okay, there you've got hydro. That's uh, obviously concentrated in the Northwest. Coal is the, it's not working, the Ohio River Basin. Natural gas um, along pipelines, not surprisingly. Uh, you can see the pipelines there. Solar, very little. Um, largely concentrated in uh, California and Arizona. Nuclear. Uh, the Midwest and Northeast, and wind is, is uh, right along the, uh, the middle of the country and the wind corridor there. Um, these aren't advancing. I don't, okay, okay. I'm not pushing it hard enough. Uh, two more slides very quickly. 
We just did a, a Mark Zoback mentioned a study we did in California, decarbonization. We did a deep dive look at how you can repurpose fossil fuel infrastructure to, to use in uh, some of the other technologies. We looked at oil refineries, natural gas generation, pipelines, ports and storage. This is just part of a long list. And then over here, how those, that infrastructure could be used for biofuels, hydrogen fuels, and feedstocks. It's worth looking at. It's a policy that, I mean, it's a set of policies that I think are very important to get this industry working with other industries, the hydrogen industry, um, um, CCUS was mentioned earlier, huge, huge knowledge base in the oil and gas industry in that area can be used for decarbonization, hydrogen and biofuels, a lot of the infrastructure can be used as well. And then finally, um, this is uh, uh, U.S. LNG export growth, important for Schneer, obviously, and I've gone through and done it. This is 2018, done it by a region or continent, and you can see them coming up there. I was surprised Mexico is a huge, uh, huge uh, customer. Middle East, not so much. Asia, South Korea is the largest customer. But the thing I would say about this, and there are the percentages, is that 69% of our LNG exports are going to OECD countries. I would make the same point about this that I made about the, the wind, solar, and battery, minerals, and metal supply chains. We need to stop being oil-centric in our energy security uh, and defense posture and look a lot more at both the gas and the renewable supply chains and make sure that those supply chains are protected. Something else that we all share, what the, what the renewables and the gas industry shares are new supply chains and a change in the U.S. defense posture to protect these supply chains. And I have been, uh, I have talked to people at the defense, uh, who, who were at the Defense Department, what are they doing here? Every year there's a defense posture review, not much in these areas. And so, so both industries have an interest in protecting the supply chain, so thank you. Thanks, Melanie. Um, so I'll ask a few questions of the panelists and then kind of like Dean Stice did in panel one, um, as you as an audience, like you to start thinking of questions you might ask to these resources up here. Um, so with, with that said, um, you know, Brian, you kind of laid out what you guys are doing at Calpine. You've, you've seen a lot, the ups and downs of the business. Um, you, you kind of laid out some of the attributes of your organization, you know. Um, tell us maybe a transaction, you know, that really kind of is an example and, and captures a lot of those, those attributes that you've seen. Yeah, so in the early 2000s, uh, Calpine started a merchant uh, combined cycle project in Bogalusa, Louisiana, which is up on the North Shore. Um, depending on who you talk to, the project got between 55 and 85 percent complete. We had the California energy crisis. The state of Louisiana decided not to deregulate. We searched for contracts, couldn't find any, and decided to halt the project. Uh, the, the power industry was uh, in a lot of turmoil following uh, the California energy crisis. You had the Enron uh, issues. Uh, and so we stopped. And so for the next 10 to 12 years, we searched for uh, a way to find a contract and complete the project uh, unsuccessfully. I, uh, I inherited the project about four years ago uh, and was able to get a contract done. But the reason was is because we were actually given the opportunity to, com to compete. Uh, and when able to compete, we were able to provide uh, a lower cost, uh, lower risk alternative. And uh, what ended up resulting was an over $200 million you know, investment in an impoverished part of Louisiana that's going to keep rates low. Uh, it's replacing an old, aging, inefficient unit with much cleaner generation. Uh, and then for the actual community itself, uh, increase the property tax base, uh, a boom for the economy. So. I mean, it's one of these win, 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 and all it took uh, was 15 years and a chance to compete, so. So Wes, we talked a little bit last night 
just kind of in the, the LNG markets, and we've seen this incredible shift, um, like really from, Melanie, when you were at DOE in the 90s, and, and then in the early 2000s, we were building all this LNG import capacity into the United States that ultimately we really never used any of. And now all of a sudden, we wanted to turn that around and go the other direction. You can't just flip the switch backwards. It, it requires new uh, construction and infrastructure investment. Um, and then we developed all this shale gas in the United States. It's, it's just been incredible, the shift from energy scarcity to abundance. And it seems obvious that LNG is, is this new global supply chain. And so I, just in the last week, I pulled down the FERC has approved Tellurian and Sempra uh, and, and you all in the LNG business like to talk in tons per annum as a gas producers like to talk in BCF. So the U.S. market's 82 BCF a day. Um, and I'm, I'm looking at these new projects that have been approved by FERC, and it's a staggering amount of gas. Now, that's not to say those capital investments are going to be approved. Um, at just the same time all this is happening, the prices in Asia have collapsed. Um, there's a lot of dynamics for you here. Can you kind of walk the, the audience through what you see the global dynamics and your decision processes at Chenier? Because it, it, it sounds almost overwhelming to me. Yeah, uh, great points. Um, you know, we're witnessing um, uh, competitors come to, come to market uh, this year. Uh, everyone's expecting Cameron to be online. Everyone's expecting Freeport to be online. Uh, and we've seen Cove Point um, begin to, uh, to ship last year. Um, it's an interesting space. Um, we were discussing the impacts of uh, uh, FERC approvals. And, and as I indicated to you last night, um, the unexpectedness would be if the FERC didn't approve. Um, uh, Tellurian and Sempra's Port Arthur. Um, and there is, as we're starting to see, a bit of difference between getting that final FERC approval and then going to final investment decision. Um, we uh, are observing that. We are expecting um, FIDs um, at the facilities just mentioned, what that means for us going forward. Um, you know, we're still working on uh, 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 Sabine Train 6 and Corpus Christi uh, Stage 3. Um, if those come online, you know, we'll be looking at a total of um, eight and a half BCF a day for the Chenier portfolio. Um, you know, one of the things that we're very... So just to put that in perspective, that would be 10% of total U.S. gas supply. It's almost, it's about a half a B shy of the entire Canadian gas economy. So um, it's, it's sizable. Um, and as I mentioned in my opening remarks, we, we recognize that there's a great responsibility uh, on our part um, with that sort, of, uh, that sort of volume. And um, it's imperative that we get it right. Um, now, there's first mover advantage. So we've got our FIDs. Obviously, those happened some time ago. We're shipping. Um, when we look at the, um, I think, believe it's colloquially uh, phrased the second wave and third waves, um, it, uh, it can become challenging to understand how um, some of these projections that are just extrapolations of growth out 10 to 20 years and you're looking at 20 to 25 BCFD waterborne out of the United States. Um, that funnel five is, is challenging to think about, um, not only from a standpoint of who you're going to sell it to, uh, but how are you going to get that gas, especially out of the Gulf Coast? Um, so there's, there's a lot of risk uh, for sure. And um, as you mentioned, not only on top of that, now you have price risk. And you know, not only are we exporting U.S. molecules, um, but in the process, we're also exporting U.S. characteristics of nat gas. Um, you know, people ask me, you know, what happened to the net backs to JKM to Asia? And there's a very simple answer. China had a warm winter. And, um, you know, that's usually an answer that you hear reserved for um, commentary on, on the U.S. gas economy. But it's now very important if Beijing is cold or warm, if, you know, if Shanghai gets cold. And it's, it's an interesting thing because if you had 10 years ago, uh, a de the degrees of freedom that orbited Henry Hub at, say, X, they're now multiples of X, and we're discovering them new every day. 
um, because again, we're now exporting the characteristics of U.S. nat gas. Um, so there are multiples, multitudes of risks. It's difficult to even catalog all of them, um, and it's more difficult to get confident about how we're going to handle them. Um, but at Chenier, you know, we've, we have that first mover advantage. Um, we believe that the U.S. export market will, will support um, uh, several more FIDs going forward. Um, but we'll see things, and we'll, you know, a lot of it will have to do also with not just the price of gas here in the U.S., but the price of oil. Um, you know, we, you can envision uh, scenarios of, of oil price where that associated uh, resource in the Permian um, is either there or it's not. And uh, it, that could become very challenging for a U.S. export market if there were to be some, for whatever reason, and we could spend all day talking about how that might happen, but if there were some sort of reason uh, that WTI starts a sustained price regime of around $40 a barrel. Um, that's going to be a lot less gas that we expected. And the, the gas coming out of the Permian, that's, that's the first slate. That's the hydro in the power stack And right now. And if it were to uh, come to pass that that um, weren't the case, it becomes difficult to understand how uh, you get some of those uh, last, second wave, and th uh, first of the third wave LNG pro uh, projects going. So I know in the audience there's a lot of energy producers here. Um, Oklahoma is a top five state in natural gas production, oil production, and wind production. Um, so we have a lot of that energy in the export markets, both in the United States, out of the state boundaries, and globally. But Melanie, when you guys looked at the California decarbonization goals, um, for the audience, actually, this is really proximate and really relevant as to how producers here may position themselves for markets that, frankly, some of them may have given up on, like New York or California. But when you all presented to the governor and you and Secretary Moniz and Dr. Zobeck, uh, you know, referred to a little of this, um, but I think if I quoted Secretary Moniz, there's no plausible path for them to meet their at least short to midterm goals without natural gas. And then you all also talked if they're looking at emissions, while they have ambitious electric vehicle adoption goals, the reality is the far bigger emission reduction potential comes from vehicles that are fossil fuel vehicles and efficiency. So I know they listen to you out there, but can you just kind of talk about this short term, mid term, that's a very different set of technologies in hand versus breakthrough technologies and how that impacts markets for here. The, the, um, as we looked at two uh, timelines, uh, two time frames, 2030 and 2050. 2030, we did not see any breakthrough technologies coming online. It's only 11 years away. The the uh, you would see you could see incremental improvements in some technologies. I think that and and there are some incentives out there for. Uh, I think Mark or somebody mentioned 45Q. Um, uh, it needs a little tinkering around the edges, uh, uh, but it, it's it, it, they enhanced and created value. Uh, for carbon, I was surprised that a Republican Congress and a Republican president signed a bill that that uh, didn't put a price on carbon, but it put a value on carbon, and and um, and so when so that's something that you could see some incremental improvements on. Uh, uh, I think that Mark Zoback showed some, one of the figures from uh, the study where the biggest gains you get, um, as you said, Mike, the biggest gains you get in transportation is from efficiency, not from EVs. Um, much smaller gains from EVs uh, uh, than, and was surprised by the result. Um, uh, the, there's a big fight going on on those CAFE standards right now. Um, uh, between California and the federal government, but you do get significant decarbonization from that. You also, we did a pathway, got by 2030, 
uh, major emissions reductions from carbon capture and sequestration. And California has some very good sequestration sites. Where you will have problems with that is, is with the regulatory structure for, uh, for uh, long-term storage of carbon. And, and, um, and quite frankly, people who just don't want to see that happen. And, um, but it is possible. And, uh, and so those were the two big areas for 2030. We think you need breakthrough technologies to meet the 2050 goals, not just in California, but across the country and quite frankly around the world. And, um, and uh, breakthrough technologies, we looked at direct air capture of carbon, uh, hydrogen, uh, wide, wide scale uh, deployment of hydrogen in all sectors, um, but, but uh, uh, hydrogen from electrolysis, not from uh, steam methane reforming. And, um, and so those are the longer term technologies. You will need those to make 2050 targets in and a, and a suite of technology for, uh, for, uh, for 2030. I would say that as the industry, and I know Mark's here somewhere, uh, yes, capture your methane, <laughs> okay, but, but uh, um, uh, deal with methane leaks, that's, a, that's an important option for reducing, uh, reducing um, uh, emissions in the country, not so much California, but. Do you mind if I? Tack on to that. So Calpine has roughly 7,000 megawatts of generation in California. So we're obviously acutely interested that in the fact that, you know, California has been on the leading edge of the renewable push. And so the, the level of penetration to date, it really is a proxy for what we should expect to see in other uh, areas of the country. Uh, Calpine commissioned a study with uh, E3, which will be public here in a few weeks. We agree. Uh, that you know, natural gas definitely plays a role. Natural gas generation plays a role in the in the near future. You know, one of the the challenges is if if we can agree on that, then the market design right. becomes an issue. Because as a power generator, you know, we're really agnostic on uh, which bucket of money uh, you 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 put it into. But we've it's either capacity, energy, or ancillaries. But at the end of the day, when you add those three up, if it doesn't cover our fixed cost, then we're going to retire our units. Right? right? And at that point, you've got a reliability issue. And reliability is, first and foremost, always the most important thing when we talk about electric generation. Well, that, that's, that's one reason why I showed the, the 90 days with no wind. Um, uh, it is important that the renewables and gas work together. And, and, uh, and something else, and we, we talk a lot about it, uh, uh, electricity, the electricity sector is the easiest to decarbonize. And it's not easy, but it's the easiest. The other sectors are much more difficult. Industry, extremely difficult. There, is, there are no alternatives right now for, for process heat that you need in industry. Um, transportation, we discussed a little bit. Uh, 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 it's just taking a long time. Those are consumer decisions. And uh, uh, there's not a whole lot you can do. Buildings, there's a lot of consumer resistance, um, uh, particularly for gas cooking. Uh, and, and the restaurant industry, et cetera, et cetera, they don't want to cook with electricity. And, um, and uh, so we've spent a fair amount of time looking at renewable gas. And, uh, but back to the, your point about your generation in California, what I don't think California realizes, 49% of their generation is gas. When you're talking, and, and, and it's the easiest sector to decarbonize, but right now, 49% of their generation is gas. And, and so if they're going to go to 60% renewables, uh, which is their goal by 2030, that's a lot. 60% renewables by 2030, and they do not count large hydro in, uh, in their renewable portfolio standard. It's extremely difficult. Our analysis says they can get there. It will be costly. They'll have to work with the gas industry for reliability issues, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, but we think they can make it. 2050, it's hard to say. You need breakthroughs. So. Just a comment really quickly. I think there's an opportunity here to observe um, progress. Um, you know, five, six, seven years ago, to discuss con US wind output from a trader standpoint, 
was something you did at a cocktail party to sort of demonstrate a little bit of knowledge outside of the conversation. Today, it's absolutely critical. Um, on a con US basis, we've seen peak days of 60 gigawatts of wind output. Just to put that in perspective, that's 120 nuclear units. The next day, it might be 30. You lose 60 nuclear units day over day. And none of you probably even hear about that, and that's a demonstration of a market that's working. Gas is there to back it up, and it's happening. And from a gas trader standpoint, it is fascinating to see the volatility in wind output and the ability for gas to fill in. So I'd like to follow up real quick on the grid reliability thing and dive a little deeper into that. And then I'd say to the audience, after that, let's go ahead and get your questions lined up. But Brian, I know on the E3 study, when we listened to it at Stanford, they put a, a cost out there to the California economy that's, that's huge but with an all renewable, differentiated from a net zero carbon. And, and basically that, like in the hundred billion dollar type range. And the mitigated cost of carbon is like on the $5,000 per ton. And I think in the EFI study, tops it's like 1100 and other technologies are lower than that. And we're gonna hear after lunch from Oxy, you know, about 45Q in their costs. Um, but I think this, you have a cost of, to the economy, you have a 5X at, at you know, vast, uh, you know, on cost, mitigated cost of carbon. But California's running a very big experiment and maybe the single biggest risk in that whole deal is grid reliability and maintaining some gas in that because as Wes said, the ability of the gas markets to balance the system is pretty extraordinary. So, you know, how, how's the message being received, you know, on the importance of grid reliability and that it could come in jeopardy without that gas supply in the system? Well, I mean, it's too to be determined on how it's going to be received, uh, but the message is, is getting louder and louder. Um, at the end of the day, they can't afford to fail, right? We can't have California, the fifth largest economy in the world, go dark. It just it doesn't work. For, for any purpose. Like I said before, reliability is first and foremost. Environmental goals come second, and then rates come third, right? Uh, so at some point, whether they you know, will admit it publicly or you know, it's propaganda for political gain or, or what have you, ultimately they're going to have to make the right decision. And the right decision until you have a, a breakthrough is that you've got to have the backup in natural gas. When you look at the studies, the studies show to get to 100%, you've got to over, uh, you've got to put in so much solar in California and then so much battery storage that in the winter when you have those week-long days that are gray, that, that, you, can, that you can be there. And it, it's impractical and it's uneconomical. So you're either going to bankrupt the state, which I, I don't think they'll ultimately do either. That doesn't make any sense or you're gonna to have to, to face the reality that without technological advancement, natural gas is gonna to have to be a major part of, the, of, your, of your grid stack. So questions from the audience? Anybody got one out here anywhere? David Victor, uh, Mike's coming your way. That's, th thank you very much. There were no questions, so I wanted to help out by asking one. Um, I guess I want to make a brief comment and then ask a question. The comment is that almost all of these models that we're using for analyzing 100% renewables and so on, I was involved in a big paper um, criticizing the 100% renewable studies, so critical, I guess, that the guy we were attacking sued our lead author. Um, these models can't really represent the behavior of the electric power system because it's so different from the way the system operates right now. So I think we should take with a grain of salt almost all these numbers coming out, you know, $5,000 a ton, whatever it is. They're in the realm of where the models can't really compute, and so the models are grasping for things and they go try and compute. I'm curious, um, maybe this question in particular for you, Brian. Your company has invested very heavily in gas. Gas has helped with shallow decarbonization but California, New York, and other places are trying to do deep decarbonization. 
when the investor community looks at Calpine, what should we see as the leading evidence of things you're doing to go beyond kind of more high efficiency combined cycle gas turbines to things that have lower footprint but still keep gas alive? Great question. Uh, Calpine actually has, uh, is one of the largest renewable producers in the state of California with our, our geysers units. It's geothermal. Uh, we also have a renewables group that has contracts uh, underway and is developing a pipeline of wind projects. We are actively pursuing and competing for solar projects, both from a development standpoint and from, uh, at least in Texas, we just signed a contract where we're going to be the off-taker, which is going to allow a solar project to be built. Uh, also in California, we are part of a pilot program uh, for carbon capture where they're taking the carbon and utilizing it in building and highway materials. Uh, we recognize that these things are coming. Our core business uh, for the foreseeable future will be in natural gas combined cycle. I wouldn't expect uh, our investors to, to, to look for us to try and add any new uh, natural gas generation in the state of California. Uh, or New York for that matter. Uh, but I, I do think that you'll see us continue to expand our renewable uh, footprint. We're also uh, heavily involved in, in battery storage as well. We've got projects all over the country that we're, we're looking at. Uh, so to answer your question, we see all these things coming. How we participate in them uh, is going to vary by, by market and by customer, but we're actively involved. If I could just say, too, uh, Electricity generation in California is 16% of the emissions. The, by far the largest uh, 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 emitting sector is transportation. And then I think industries next and then buildings. And so, so the focus on electricity is important and I think that that's why people want to electrify everything. If you can decarbonize your electricity sector, then you can electrify uh, and you can electrify part of industry, which we did look at, and you can do that. And transportation, uh, uh, you can electrify some of that, but, but I was uh, trying to find out before I came up here. Uh, I've seen Fatih Birol in, in various uh, 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 venues around the world, and he's the head of the International Energy Agency. And hit their forecasts for electric vehicles globally are pretty small. And, and so I think that's going to be time consuming uh, to electrify your transportation sector. So, so um, electricity is important and decarbonizing it is important, but it's not going to get you that much. Not, certainly not in the 2030 time frame. And, um, and, uh, and in the meantime, we do have to worry about things like, like reliability. And I, I, I don't want to uh, downplay what California is doing in, in renewable power generation. It's important. They are leaders in that area. And, um, and the, our message um, that you need, basically you need fuel f to, to back up your, your, uh, your intermittent renewables was not, not uh, discredited or was not an outcry or, or anything like that. Um, I think people were understanding of the critical role that gas, certainly the role that gas is playing right now. And, uh, but it's, it's not that big of a uh, percentage of the emissions in California. Yeah. But you have to look at everything as a yeah. system. I'll echo it yeah. again. You know, if, if you're going, if, if you're going to take the tact of we're going to modify the transportation industry by pushing EVs, you've now, yeah. you've now impacted the ele right, right. electricity market. You know, if you put five million EVs on, not only are you increasing the amount of demand, but you're in, you're changing the time of the demand. People charge their cars at night. The sun doesn't shine at right. night. So, you know, your your solar solution is is less effective. Uh, you know. Exporting natural gas is, is, is great for producers, but at the same time, you, you know, it also elevates natural gas prices domestically. You elevate natural gas prices, the cost of a natural gas electricity goes up. It, it's, it's all a balance. It, it's, a, it's a balloon. You push one side of it and the other side grows. So you know, this kind of conversation where everybody is thinking more of, a, uh, more of it as a system is exactly what has to happen in order to get to the optimal solution. We, we did calculate how much additional generation you would need for 5 million electric vehicles and if you electrified buildings. 
uh, to the to the degree that you could, and you need a lot more generation and and storage, et cetera, et cetera, if it's renewable generation. Actually, in a in a rational market, it should work where the price goes up when you export it, but. As Wes has ramped up his exports, I think the gas uh, producers. I was going to step in there for just a second. <laughs> it hadn't quite worked like it was supposed to. But um, it was it was warm in China. <laughs> yeah. So, want to make sure we we do get the opportunity for others who who may have questions out there. Any out here in the front? My question is for is for Miss Kinderdine. Uh, could you expound a little bit on repurposing fossil fuel infrastructure for decarbonization? Or, I think that's how you put it. Right. We, we uh, using, uh, and I, I mentioned renewable gas, okay, and, uh, and agriculture, this is specific to California, and we've been looking at them, uh, all of the sectors there, agriculture, another sector that's very difficult to decarbonize. It's only 8% of the emissions. Um, but if you can use agricultural byproducts um, uh, to make renewable gas, you can use renewable gas in, in, uh, with some modifications uh, in pipelines and and in it needs some processing, but gas needs processing in general. Okay, you can use that renewable gas in the existing infrastructure. Um, hydrogen. There's a lot of debate as to how much hydrogen you can put in the existing uh, pipeline system. Five percent, ten percent. But that's another thing. And hydrogen. Uh, uh, is, ha, can be used in all end use sectors. Um, so if you can use as much of your infrastructure for hydrogen, you can use hydrogen in NGCC plants. Um, uh, and so uh, uh, I would say that that uh, the the storage facilities um, that you had that the oil and gas industry has at in ports might be useful for other types of energy. Um, and so, so uh, they're just a range of things. And, and I'm happy to, uh, we're going to publish this study. Uh, if I take two more long plane rides, which I'm going to in the next day or so, I can finish editing the final document. And we'll be publishing it by, by May 1st. And so there's a, much more than I showed in that little slide I had here. Um, on on the things you could do with existing infrastructure, and and uh, my, I, the oil and gas industry and companies have a fiduciary responsibility to protect the value of their infrastructure. We need to understand that, and and um, uh, the the willingness to strand that infrastructure. Um, I think has, has uh, without regard to that fiduciary responsibility or its value, has delayed a response to what I think is an existential threat of climate change. And so the th anything that we can do to stop creating immovable objects like that, um, I think is critical, and that's why we're looking at how to repurpose that infrastructure. So, so Miles? Uh, this is a question for Wes. Um, Chenier and, and now obviously others have uh, kind of inaugurated the sea change um, in as far as the U.S. Uh, uh, export of natural gas, but you're, you've entered an existing global LNG market. Um, what do you see as the changes we can expect as far as uh, new capacity being brought online elsewhere? Where, who's going to be active in that, and where do, where do you see the most of that happening? Um, Good question. I, you know, a lot of the things that we're seeing on the margin are um, floating uh, liquefaction facilities. Um, Mozambique, for instance, uh, the Anadarko um, Chevron deal that just uh, consummated a couple weeks ago is a good example of that. Um, from my lens, the, the number one, um, the, the lead opportunity for non-U.S. Um, liquefaction is going to be Qatar. Um, they are positioned to uh, uh, 
engage a, a market that did 315 MTPA last year um, in a way that others aren't. Um, when we look at demand opportunities going forward, you know, we did, th like I said, we did 315 MTPA in the uh, global LNG economy last year. We think that doubles in 10 years. Um, and so there's going to be a lot of opportunity for a lot of people. Um, it'll come down to price. This, you know, the market will, will start to clear like a commodity as it should. Um, but I think your, your, your lead opportunity is going to be in, in Qatar. Um, and then more to another point and a little off the uh, questions path, um, there's going to be opportunity for gas economies around the world to reduce their need for LNG import. Um, China, for instance, right now, can, uh, they produce about half what they consume. Um, we think that gets lower on a percentage basis as they grow, um, but just like we didn't see shale here in the U.S., um, and just like we don't understand what the next technology improvement is um, going forward and the good work that's even happening in this building to that effect, um, you know, not only is there uh, a threat for U.S. LNG export opportunities through additional liquefaction outside the U.S., namely Qatar, in my opinion, it's going to be their opportunity to endogenously develop their own gas resources. Um, so I think that's, those are two things that, we are, that are on our radar. Um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, it's a little more complicated to liquefy gas than to go ahead and get your own dry gas, you know, in your backyard. Um, so there's an incentive to uh, develop your endogenous resources. Um, that's going to come down to rock permeability. That's going to come down to water availability. That's going to be a big problem um, for, for um, resource development. Um, internationally, but uh, to your point, I think I think Qatar leads um, and uh, floating um, liquefaction projects um, around the world. Um, those have really started to come to the forefront. Um, we'll be interested to see how well those are on a reliability standpoint. Um, liquefying gas is hard, and to do it on a ship with dramatically condensed uh, engineering, it'll be interesting to see how that works out. If I could say, on we, we did a study of uh, uh, African gas and developing African gas for Africans as opposed to exporting it. And, and, uh, and I think it's very important when you look at, I looked at uh, 25 countries and, uh, and their elect rural electrification rates in six or seven of them, one, two, three percent. So, so uh, getting them energy is important. And then they've got huge cities, okay, where this, the world's gonna add in by 2030, 10 cities of 10 million people in population. Three of them are in Africa. And, and looking at the floating LNG as a way to create demand so you can bootstrap the infrastructure uh, development in Africa, and I think it, it has a, the, the floating LNG might have an important role to play there to, to start creating the demand so that they can start developing their own resources for, for themselves. So. If you want a great example of how domestic uh, policies and permit approval uh, impacts uh, the market, so at the same time, Wes and Chenier have been exporting natural, or LNG. Uh, this winter in New England, they imported LNG, right? right. right? So uh, someone mentioned earlier, you know, twelve dollars in MBTU. I mean, that. You th th think about that. Yeah. That was the rumor. <laughs> so we probably have time for one more question, Steve. So uh, this question is just kind of a follow-up to Wes. Can you educate a little bit on contracting for LNG? Where are the major markets for U.S. LNG exports, what's the, the term now? I mean, is there a spot market in LNG or are they all long-term contracts? And the pricing, is it tied to a basket of oil or is it tied to Henry Hub? Or I need an LNG 101 lesson. This is a great question because I can't get it wrong. <laughs> um, and the reason for that is because it's undefined. Um, it is evolving as I speak in this chair. Um, it is traditionally an oil index long-term market. Well, as oil and gas started to 
price away from each other. You know, back before 2001, oil, the oil gas price ratio was six to one, and it reverted to six to one if it ever if it ever went out, and that was because there's 5.8 mm BTUs in a barrel of crude oil. Um, but it was a market that was ready for uh, conditions to change to prove that that was just a mathematical uh, manifestation and not something that you could actually act upon. And for instance, you couldn't go to the airport and have a fuel switch for the departing aircraft. Um, you're starting to see that now with global LNG. We've been rallying crude oil for the past four months. Spot prices in Asia for LNG have been plummeting. So we are in a really our first durable situation where Asian LNG spot prices are, have nothing to do in the moment day to day with crude oil. So you'll have those who are engaged in long-term contracts predicated off, uh, based off of crude oil saying, man, look at this spot market. I feel like I'm the mark in the poker game. So that is driving a, a great deal of effort to um, reconstitute pricing. Um, so not only on pricing, but also uh, optionality on where you can take those ships. Um, it's all evolving. Um, for instance, Tokyo Gas and Shell just three weeks ago announced a coal indexed LNG deal. Um, that was very surprising, but it's also demonstrative of a market that's trying to figure out how to do this. So to answer your question, is it Henry Hub? Yes. Is it TTF? Yes. Is it oil? Yes. Is it Rotterdam coal now? Yes. Um, what's going to end up eventually happening is LNG will start to price on its own merits. It will become its own commodity. And um, the, the way that that's going to happen is spot transactions, long-term transactions. Um, like I said, we, we see uh, global LNG doubling in the next 10 to 12 years. Um, there's going to be a lot of opportunity to get uh, to, to, to experiment on what's going to work for both the liquefier and the, con the consumer. Um, we're also hearing about things like actual dry gas producers here in the U.S getting some sort of opportunity to participate in those pricing mechanisms. So it's not only happening just at the liquefaction, but it's going all the way upstream. Um, so the, to answer your question, yes. And um, it, 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 there's a great deal of opportunity here, um, but eventually the market will get it right um, and LNG will almost certainly become its own commodity. See, and, and to that point, I'm an analyst. We do weird things in the middle of the night. Uh, added up the and the, these were LNG uh, uh, liquefaction facilities under construction, not projects announced. You know, these were being constructed. And by 2020, if if all of the projects under construction are finalized and used at their capacity, for the first time ever. LNG volumes will approximate pipeline volumes in the world. That's the development of, of a global LNG market, and, and you're seeing that happen. So, so Wes, to follow up a little bit on that, and we talked about all these FERC approvals, okay? That, as you, I think you indicated, the FERC approvals are kind of expected, but that in no way applies implies or guarantees the projects will actually be built. So there's an FID decision process, okay? This pricing mechanism and the markets, I mean, how do you, how do you get your head around? I mean, because that's clearly going to be one of the decision points. Yeah, I mean, how, much, how much am I selling for, my product for? For you and for all your competitors. Absolutely. Um, and that'll speed the process. And like I mentioned earlier, um, not only are we exporting U.S. gas, but we're exporting U.S. gas characteristics. I envision global basis. So not just Algonquin gas, not just Transco Zone 5, not just Opal, but Singapore, Rotterdam. And it'll trade, I, I envision it, akin to what we're seeing with U.S. pipelines, the U.S. pipeline grid. Um, now, the difference, it'll be a little bit different, obviously, because it takes days and weeks to affect the opportunities, unlike U.S. grid, it takes a, you know, significantly less time. Um, but to, to, to answer your question, it, it is a risk that is enormous. It's difficult to get your arms around it. And if it requires a degree of um, risk tolerance and, and uh, dismiss, uh, dismissing some risk aversion to get the projects done. Because if you need certainty on that back end, uh, 
it's going to be a long day. <laughs> How much, if, if you look at all the projects that are out there potential right now, but what's the rough approximation of the capital investment that, that could go into all that? Do you have any idea what that is? I can't give you a, a great number, but it, uh, your imagination is probably not far off. 20, 30 billion dollars. Um, and what's important is not only do we need investment in liquefaction, not only do we need investment in regas, but we need investment in midstream. Um, it's one thing to have a beautiful world-class facility with wonderful berth and great dredging and, and draft and all of that. It's a whole other thing to get that gas to the terminal. And um, you know, one of the things that we uh, look at on a consistent basis is, you know, how does the, you know, how do we support, you know, 50 MTPA, 100 MTPA, 250 MTPA of U.S. export? Um, and the, I think what's missing in the conversation is uh, uh, the importance that's going to be played in midstream. Um, if we can't get incremental pipes built, if we can't get greenfield or even brownfield, if we can't, if all, we, if all we're left to is looping and compression on existing pipelines um, up out of the Northeast, uh, the Marcellus is going to have a limited role in U.S. LNG export um, in the next decade. So with that, if you all could join me in thanking uh, a great panel on customers. <laughs>